about Russia Twitter, the policy of all the users of Twitter. Uh, one the question from Tanner. Uh, I'm just waiting. I think comes for four, actually. Good day. Oh, Grzegorz, Fritz, you're going to have a pleasure of moderating another slightly late panel, but I hope this short, tiny little break for you following the very high emotions of the first panel, today's first panel, was needed. The second panel is going to be more of a Polish-speaking panel concentrating on the problems of post-war migrations in Lower Silesia. We'll also deal with certain phenomena that were typical of the entire territory of what was referred to as the regained lands, namely the uh, the eastern territories of the uh, post-war Germany or pre-war Germany. But uh, all these phenomena apply to the region of Lower Silesia to the largest extent, which was the, uh, the wealthiest, the most abundant region of the then regions of eastern Germany. From the pers and that's why the phenomenon of looting was most extensive in these lands and how the then official policymakers referred to. That would be another problem to be discussed. Uh, Michał Surowicz will be the first speaker addressing this subject as the first one. And let me let me remind you that you have 20 minutes now and I will do my best to well, make use of uh, the disciplinary means that I have at hand. Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm Michał Surowiec. I work at the Wrocław Institute of National uh, Remembrance, and I'm a doctoral student. Uh, my doctoral dissertation is uh, mainly devoted to the settling uh, campaign, but I primarily focus on the pioneering in the Lower Silesian lands. Looting is a phenomenon that uh, well, uh, refers to the title of my doctoral uh, thesis on account of the fact it will not be uh, published probably because it was uh, already uh, has already been published in the literature on the subject. It might extend certain items, but uh, insofar as the project provided or presentations provided in uh, categories uh, are legitimate, uh, but as far as the publication is concerned, it would be unnecessary. My presentation will be divided into a couple of uh, parts. I will focus on the evolution of the term loot or looting, which is key, uh, considering further elaborations, then I will focus on the chronology of the evolution of the term, which has become a base point for the entire elaboration of mine and the key point, namely the uh, dissemination of the term. Obviously, there are going to be some conclusions uh, stemming from the previous two, two uh, other items. Um, it will be uh, focusing on how looting was addressed by communist uh, authorities. This is not going to be a presentation devoted directly to looting, but also a presentation that will propose a certain interpretation of the phenomenon of uh, looting vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the communist propaganda and how it might have been used by the propaganda. It is clear that in, I was inspired for the presentation as well as for my dissertation was uh, Jerzy Hoffman's and uh, Jerzy film, Prawo i Pięść, was referred to as Western or Eastern. Um, 
film, which refers to the reality of 1945. Law in the Fist would be its English title. Namely, it was uh, a film that was actually taking a look at the destroyed reality of Western Poland, even though it was shot in Poland, it was actually something that was supposed to be a kind of imaginary town that is supposed to um, representative of the entire Chivovo, um, Graustadt in, in German. Um, it was supposed to be representative of all these lands. Uh, the main protagonist uh, tries to, using their decisions and actions, present and comment upon the consequences of the actions undertaken. That time, uh, Andre King, uh, our, let's say, white, white um, protagonist, uh, well, quite literally, uh, because it is so monochromatic, he wears white. He shines right, as he is pictured in night scenes while Dr. Mielecki, still wearing black, the only element of his uh, posture is this threatening, menacing face, trying to trying to convince the main protagonist to obviously take part in the looting procedure. This is obviously a film that, uh, that tries to criticize looting, but it's also a kind of a different commenting um, nature to this film and the very par last part of my um, descriptive part. Um, even though uh, Andrzej Koenig actually saves uh, the community of, uh, of Graustadt, of Shewitt, uh, but unfortunately, in order to protect his property, he had to kill his uh, fellow uh, people. Got three people get shot during the protection of this property, and he survives. He really is emotional about the very fact that Poles were forced to take part in looting procedures so without the experience of the Second World War. And this is precisely what the protagonist in the film described. This is also a reference to the theory later uh, developed, uh, Marcin Zaremba, the broken windows theory, as it is referred to. But I may be able to elaborate upon that later. The phenomenon of looting, as I've already mentioned, in the 1960s, well, this uh, phenomenon is being addressed in a more nuanced manner because uh, basically earlier it was not the case in 1945. I just underlined the most saucy, as I can tell, the elements of a statement. Engineer uh, Vengeruf, the vice governor, that uh, the third uh, assembly of proxies of 1945 simply calls for an action against looters. But in order to stress how bloody this fight would be, he actually makes a reference to establishing a concentration camp. Let me stress that this is just a post war time, so this is a very strong sentence. And filling this concentration camp with people, with looters, that simply should be forced and doomed to get to the concentration camp. So there was no place of balancing the opinions. This is a scene of a war, and this is actually perceived as a war crime. Going further, the interpretation of what loot is and what looting is, it changed in time. I allow myself to actually travel back in time to the beginnings of the 19th century. Uh, obviously, for the sake of my article, the dictionaries of Polish uh, language were giving uh, kind of a highlight of uh, a popularity of the given term in time. So, in other words, if it was included in a dictionary, it was popular to the extent that it was actually included in the dictionary. Uh, Linda's dictionary of uh, 1812, where the term looting is simply, or loot, is mentioned as an element of ceramics. Now, the Phineas um, dictionary of um, 1811, this rock, this stone that was referred to in Linda's dictionary is an element of a paved or a hardened road. This is an element of a road. And this is just a noun. There's no verb of loot. There's just a loot with reference to a rock, a ball that is supposed to be placed in paved road. Moving to the what was referred to as the Warsaw Dictionary uh, of 1915, this term became more and more popular. It gained further new meanings. Obviously, yes, it still means a part of a brick, a boulder, a part of rook, also with regard to use something in masonry, a part of an umbrella as well, interestingly, by the way. But some new meaning assigned to this term, as you can see, underlined in blue on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see how many different um, handicraft, many uh, crafts people actually use this term in professional nomenclature, but a more contemporary, contemporary meaning uh, underlined in red was simply to, uh, to get on to, to, to bargain. 
And now we are moving to 1958. Dorshevsky's dictionary and account of the fact that in 1939, obviously, uh, the war broke out. Uh, Tadeusz Lerswawinski's dictionary ends with letter N. Unfortunately, uh, so we have to move to chronological problem well described in Machin Zaremba's uh, book. How it happened that loot were the terms appropriation of someone's property evolved uh, from a term that referred to a piece of road, a piece of paved road. And um, Dr. Zaremba stresses two elements very hardly that we are incapable of actually indicating this evolution of the term. I'm not uh, utterly uh, sure that this is the case. And we are, cannot describe the popularization of this or dissemination of this term when it became so popular. He also stresses very interesting uh, themes, namely the theme of the broken windows theory, as I refer to, and I will return to in a moment. But to cut a long story short, it is about with a lowering morale uh, of a given individual. The given individual is more so susceptible to making evil choices, morally speaking. So under certain normal conditions, a person would not go to a flat of one's neighbor and to loot the property. Uh, obviously, during wartime, this is admissible on account of the circumstances. And obviously, in the Warsaw Ghetto, that was the place where we might seek for the transformations of the term loot going on. I browsed through certain archives of Linda Bloom where I found several interesting quotations that indicate explicitly that the term loot or the contemporary interpretation of loot emerged in roughly uh, between 1942-45. The first remark appeared in 1940, the word looter. So this term was used before that, but not having been defined. The first attempts to define, according, according to my research for the Lingeblum's uh, archives, was after this Warsaw, so after September 1942. And I quote here from Abraham Levin, 29th of September 1942, where the author, a teacher, indicates that it was supposed to be an activity of collecting uh, precious things left uh, from Jewish apartments. And she says the origin of the term was supposed to be also from uh, handicrafts jargon, but also indicates to a certain Gen German stem, which is to a certain extent also true, especially considering the Vilnius diction that would confirm this particular thesis. And then a quotation from Emmanuel Lingablu, um, the founder of Anya Shabbat, uh, thanks to which we can actually use these um, materials. Uh, again, from 1942, an exquotation of Lingablu clearly indicates that looting is supposed to be linked with the activity of actually selling things left from uh, the uh, expelled persons. Well, in terms of the situation after the settling of the situation in the Warsaw uh, Jewish ghetto, we have a more narrative uh, approach to this term. And as we can read, it was supposed to be a an activity following the displacement of the given inhabitant of a given flat, namely appropriation of uh, his or her property left, obviously, for good. Now, moving to Droshevsky's uh, dictionary. Mm. Developed in the 1960s and 70s, we can see the term contemporarily not differing from um, Dorshevsky's uh, definition. Just minute changes here. So, for the sake of the article, actually, there's no point actually in continuing this elaboration here. So, you can see the term changes its meaning, which is also very important. That's just. Uh, three out of seven definitions that he refers to. These are the most important here. So to loot would mean to steal, to rob, to uh, appropriate uh, non-secured property or appropriation of a property left uh, without the right security. And importantly, the author also refers to the old or early 20th century or late 19th century definitions indicating to the noun forms of the term, not just activity, but a noun. Importantly, starting from uh, Dorshevsky's dictionary, a loot is just considered to be an activity of previous forms as the uh, author of the dictionary indicates were archaic. So moving from terminology problem to the very subject of my presentation, the main problem of the the activity of looting in regained lands, um, 
post-World War II um, is the decree on uh, abandoned property. Of 1945, the property. If the given activity was supposed to be called as loot, the property must be uh, according to the criterion of being left without proper security. With Article 1, the deficient provider thereof, we are not interested in that on account of the uh, territorial division. The long cut, the long story short, it was before uh, September 1st, uh, 1939. For obvious reasons, we are incapable of actually indicating this kind of a property. Uh, but for the second article, with lost property or abandoned property, it's an interesting definition on account of how extensive it was. To la- cut the long story short, an abandoned property is everything that belonged to or was held by the German state. In other words, even the properties that things transported during the September campaign to the Lower Silesian mm, lands so were held by the German state. So, well, that actually has the property uh, the characteristics of uh, abandoned property. A very interesting clause in this case, uh, also so that uh, there is no doubt about what looting is, what the property actually, or who the property actually belongs to, is Article 4, creating a clause of uh, bad intent, person with or a holder of bad faith, actually. On account of the fact that this is a property that has the characteristic of abandoned property, it may be deprived, uh, the given person may be deprived of this property, the holder in bad faith, as it is um, properly referred to. In other words, the state is entitled to appropriate this um, this property for the very reason. Well, it's really difficult to find an abandoned property that is not according to this definition. and. Slightly jokingly, uh, moving to this um, temporary, temporary national, temporary state government. Uh, the well, the temporary, temporary government is actually kind of an extension of the Ministry of State Treasury, which claim that the abandoned property is included in the budget of the Ministry of Treasury. So it's the property of the state. It's important to the point that later on it would normalize standardize what the phenomenon of looting was according to the propaganda. But more about it later. In 1945, uh, looting uh, was perceived by the person who was supposed to create a public and administrative life in Lower Silesia didn't know what it is, what it was, and how it should be defined. And just a good example here, a very a quotation of an important person namely Major Stanislav uh, Miorek uh, or Stanislav Schlieber, that was the director of the security office in September 1945, who clearly states that he was incapable of clearly determining what looting was. The most interesting thing is what, what looting really is. He tries to obviously define and uh, refers to different uh, penal codes or criminal codes. So there is the pre-war criminal code, which collaborates with the decree uh, of uh, September 1944 with the uh, martial law period that is going to be abolished at the end of 1945. At the same time, there is this criminal code of the Polish army that, to cut a long story short, guarantees death penalty for any major offense at this period. So when Major Imiowek thinks what sort of article uh, the procedure actually corresponds to, he uh, he uh, refers to either theft or forgery, and he calls that to be uh, evil deeds. But he suggests that a new definition could be created that enables the authorities to act. Appropriation of uh, someone else's property to be served by uh, imprisonment uh, up to 15 years. So again, a reference to the small penal code uh, that will be uh, enacted in 1946. To cut a long story short, um, the death penalty was replaced by an imprisonment penalty up to 16 years. However, the problem in 1945 was significant. So the very uh, um, the very meetings of independent potentiaries of state authorities were very interesting. A digression of sorts. Practically speaking, this is not a typical source material to the point that we are capable of testing these um, 
These materials and the descriptions and they are still being verified by people who simply created the reality of Lois Ilegi in 1945. And now, moving to my comment upon the very phenomenon of looting, I decided, and obviously just the aggression again, uh, there are so many different examples, I just decided to refer to the most interesting ones again. A uh, statement, quotation of Stanislav Piaskowski, uh, a, a future um, Lower Silesian voivode, who at the same meeting on the 9th of September spoke about his perception and his struggle against uh, his fight against looting and different typologies he refers to. And these quotations are supposed to highlight two elements, namely, in the previous slide and this slide, they refer to a struggle of Mr. Wojciech Piaskowski with, the, let's say, the national or state looting. And he also refers to individual looting, the one that should be fought against primarily. Piaskowski also criticizes on, uh, on the Polish People's, uh, Polish, uh, uh, People's Party. Looting also appears in the prayers, uh, the main carrier of propaganda of that time, in the first source being um, Dolnośląski Pionier, uh, the magazine, uh, and the article entitled Fighting Against Looting and Speculation. Narrative repeats itself all the time. Um, so the coerced force camps, but also fights against looting, the arena of fighting with looting. But there are also some attempts to show, to demonstrate that looting may be something good. Unfortunately, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to elaborate on this particular theme. It was rather showing that this typology was a breeding with regard to its unclear, uh, actually, definition what loot what uh, really was. And conclusions that are not provided here on slide, on account of the fact that I'm uh, actually finalizing this article, and I wouldn't like to suggest you too much or suggest uh, final conclusions that were actually uh, have an impact on my dissertation. The reality of propaganda of 19, um, 1945. So the, the, the forces of good and forces of evil, uh, the, the distinction was not that clear, obviously. It was more of a blurred time. We are just talking about general trend. Looting was accepted in state's circles as a threat, not because uh, re the settlers would have no property coming to Western lands, but the point was that it was actually looting on the state's property. So the point of gravity was slightly differently, and the very phenomenon of looting was, to a certain extent, a fight against, or to say lesser, was not positive from the state's perspective. The communist state strive from obviously the depriving people of private property. So when someone actually gets hold of some property, becomes an owner, obviously illegally, strictly put, but it was also about this social engineering uh, any techniques related there too, because people coming here had very little because they left all the property in the east. So when coming to uh, uh, Lower Silesia, they were supposed to be given equivalent of the property, but they didn't. They can just lease it by 1948, lease the property when the campaign of actually endowing them with some property started. So people coming to Lower Silesia who were not looters, and maybe in the fire we could talk more about what positive loot was, well, left with virtually nothing in hands. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I would like to thank for, for sticking to the time, but also for the extremely interesting comments on um, the terminology of looting. And it seems that, um, you know, in the um, 30s or 40s, uh, this um, vocabulary generally used to, uh, came to include this, um, well, this, this prison uh, terminology that uh, used to function in this criminal subculture. And, and then it's kind of spread into the um, general language 
So it penetrated into the general language from this kind of criminal subculture, and I believe that it was really interesting to um, point out this. Uh, unfortunately, the speaker didn't have enough time to to kind of delve deeper into into that. So, in, in that you know, individual looting and state uh, sanctioned looting or state looting. So um, w whether you know, looting was um, considered as theft. Well, the state kind of. Uh, eliminated competition or rivalry in this theft by treating it as an offense. So, so well, I guess that um, the, the discussion will be um, um, excellent. If but we should take it outside also to um, to learn about the, uh, the the more extensive arguments concerning looting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the next presentation as part of this panel by Aneta Filipuzon, who represents the University of Wrocław. And she will refer to leaflets and occasional prints, uh, things that, well, perhaps escape our attention sometimes, and which is um, transient and uh, volatile in our memory. However, it might point to the relations between uh, displaced persons, uh, recentlies, and uh, allies, and um, and uh, well, actually, allies. This is a topic I'm um, I'm thinking about. And here we have a Soviet-produced stopwatch. Um, so this is what I think about when I think about allies, right? Um, so. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this will show us a very interesting topic indeed, because we often talk about this presence and this influx of human masses, and we're talking about administration, Polish administration, this temporary administration, and which um, kind of took root increasingly strongly in these western and northern lands. Uh, but sometimes it eludes us, you know, this um, presence of um, of this Red Army, and then of the Soviet Army after afterwards, which determined the conditions of safety, security, and life at least until 1946. And I believe that uh, this presentation uh, will give us um, some insight into this and um, into its influence in the subsequent period, especially in Lower Silesia. I'm sorry for um, taking up your time. Um, uh, uh, sorry for taking a bit of your s sensational information. But here there was the headquarters of the Red Army's uh, northern uh, section. But in, although I would like to remind you that initially the headquarters um, were in Szczecin, and in 1945, June, uh, the place of station of the northern group was supposed to be Łódź. But that's just, you know, by the way. Thank you for the introduction, uh, uh, Professor. And I would like to dedicate my presentation to this particular presence of uh, soldiers of the Red Army, then renamed well, soon after World War II to the Soviet Army. And I would like to show you some occasional prints, leaflets, original. Uh, traces which in um, the normal conditions of life of this society are a kind of social barometer, really. These occasional prints I will show you um, were actually presented for public reading and were presented in places where those uh, gathering here, those who came to Lower Silesia, uh, were present, and they are mainly from the Lusatian collection of the University Library in Wrocław. But some of these occasional ephemeral prints are kept in the uh, Ossolineum Library and in the State Archive, National Archive. And I do recommend um, this uh, huge collection of photographs from that period, which present even more poignantly the um, um, presence of the Allied Army, Soviet Army, uh, actually. Uh, actually, it is in the shadow of that army that um, events un unfolded here. So after the military operations of the Second World War, Lower Silesia was presented by the propaganda as an El Dorado. However, it was neither calm nor affluent. And uh, it uh, turned out that one of the uh, Professor Antoni Knot and Zofia Kostomska Zarzycka, who uh, went all along the route from Lviv, and she had no, nothing to eat, she had to sell her property. 
and then she found herself as part of a group of the pioneers together with Professor Kulczynski came to Wrocław. So thanks to their efforts, in particular, we have the opportunity to uh, actually see these documents, these ephemeral prints. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the purposes of uh, today's presentation, I um, browsed a couple of Russian websites which um, actually uh, gather some uh, recollections, memories of soldiers who are here in 45 to 56, uh, all their descendants, by the way, including the great-granddaughter of Konstantin Rokosovsky, who was the commander-in-chief of the North Group of the Red Army, which was created on the 29th of May of 1945. And as the professor was kind enough to mention, Lignica was chosen for various reasons after Szczecin and Łódź. What determined this was the complex of barracks uh, from the 1930s, excellently furnished, and the airport, and of course around 60,000 flats that stood um, empty after the German population which had left the city and the vicinity of railroads and of the German border and of the Czechoslovakian border. So um, those were the turning points, really, that led to the sighting of the headquarters. So representatives of different nations um, appeared in Lower Silesia, including citizens of the Soviet Union uh, who would end up here in the, this land as POWs or um, as um, compulsory, compulsory workers. And obviously, also Poles would end up in Lower Silesia due to, um, due to uh, the fact that they were prisoners of war or they were used for compulsory agricultural agricultural work. Generalplan Ost was also implemented here, and uh, that was a very uh, painful also um, matter. 200,000 Polish children with Aryan features of up to 14 years of age, they were transported out of Poland uh, uh, to to the Nazi Reich, and um, and they were uh, later they were later sought by by various um, officials, Soviet officials and 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 fr officials from the city of Wrocław, and there were also some Italian prisoners of war, and um, also also other well, members of the resistance of the French resistance, and um, and um, uh, we can find members of uh, various groups uh, of that sort here, and um, well. You know, these people would stay here, some would come back, um, go back home. And then the collection of press cuttings kept at the university library in Wrocław, we have info about these um, compulsory workers, um, and people who would leave Gros Rosen and uh, it's, 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 it's branches of the, of the work camps, which were scattered quite, in quite great numbers in Lower Silesia. They would come back to the east in the first and columns, and often singing some patriotic songs. But resettlements would take place uh, in uh, several phases with different levels of intensity. And the highest intensity, um, that was between 1945, 1947, and uh, later uh, from 1946 until, well, the 1960s even. I'll show you some statistics. Um, settlement in Lower Silesia, um, there, there were hundreds of thousands of people who were resettled were displaced, and there was a very interesting paper on looting. Well, you know, these people who were pauperized, extremely uh, impoverished after these tragic experiences known from our unfortunately bloody history would come here uh, extremely poor, and this migration, these resettlements would take place hastily and chaotically. And the State Repatriation Office was um, established relatively late. Uh, all, and although it made efforts to, to sort of control this whole process of resettlement of, um, of the human masses, the office was unable to cope entirely with this huge effort. And this is um, a Polish Red Cross um, website photo. And the Polish Red Cross would join into this resettlement action. And until 1946 until January, actually, at some points, uh, providing help to these uh, people being resettled, around 90,000 modest food rations were distributed between these people. Uh, they were also, they came to a large extent for the Polish diaspora in the United States. 
because in Lower Silesia, well, the, the Red Army passed through Lower Silesia, heading towards Berlin in this uh, vi Vistula order. Uh, action, uh, this campaign, and then they would come back from Berlin. Also, soldiers who'd been demobbed as soldiers from um, from you know, the Soviet army who would come back uh, to their homeland. So this army crossed these um, uh, lands twice, and uh, also uh, it, there was info about uh, the, those Germans uh, who were deported from this, who were forced to leave information about how much property they were allowed to take with them. Often the propaganda would use this fact, and this would be juxtaposed against those impoverished people being resettled. And uh, so it was all the more tragic since this um, uh, 75 uh, 90 uh, ordinance of this special committee issued in 1945 ordered um, that all sorts of property be um, um, actually be transported out of the German territories. And nobody looked at the, the, the fact that by the, the new geopolitical order, these lands would be Polish. And obviously, factory fittings um, and, and, and equipment would uh, would uh, be covered by that. But also, also people who would um, have their personal property taken away. And for instance, people who came from Kielce, uh, for the harvest, they simply had n nothing to eat. There was around 1,000 people who would come from Kielce, and they went through so-called filters, so that also those filters, so-called filters, operate also on the Polish-Soviet border, and sometimes, uh, well, people would not emerge unscathed from these filters, and uh, Soviet soldiers would take property, would, um, would basically steal people's um, horses, carts, um, uh, with harnesses and, and so on, uh, the carts were supposed to carry, have carried these repatriates from um, beyond the Bug River. And um, we don't know exactly, although numerous historians have been making the effort to identify the numbers. And this army was estimated at 300 to 400,000 soldiers. And uh, these um, points were distributed uh, in the territory of Poland. There were two types of centers where the um, Soviet army would be located. So these were the um, sort of command headquarters, uh, which were supposed to check the property to be transported into the Soviet Union as per the order we talked about. And that was without any military station there. There were clerks, there were officials, obviously part of the Red Army, but no uh, rank and file soldiers, frontline soldiers, but in the garrisons there were major forces of, um, of, of, of soldiers. And those garrisons were situated to a large extent in Lower Silesia. And it is worth showing a map here. And this map is from the Institute of National Remembrance Resources, but it shows us just how numerous these points, these settlements were here along the border, and this military settlement um, was actually performed here to protect the new borders. So um, uh, basically in Bonne Sulimovo, there was the largest concentration, but also in the area of Legnica, Kshiva, and in various other localities. And it is worth mentioning at this point that the Russians also deliberately um, um, veiled this, this plan to develop aviation also in the territory of Lower Silesia. And ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to perhaps uh, do the largest um, test uh, military um, testing grounds, which covered thousands of hectares. Uh, and. Um, so these training grounds, you know, the army treated this as uh, basically their their spoils from from the war, and um, and often they would um, basically you know, travel in the south from Legnica. You know, some officials would also end up in Wrocław because they were driven out of their um, of their offices by the Russians, who treated this land as their property as spoils of war. And um, they also encountered civilians. And the situation stabilized with time. Around 1947, uh, by, you know, the number of um, the Russian soldiers decreased to around 30% uh, of the initial number. And eventually, after the thaw, 
um, the so-called Thor, the um, numbers were 62 to 66,000 soldiers. And obviously, they were accompanied by civilian employees. And here, various statistics show different uh, different figures. And it is estimated that around 4,000 civilian, um, well, the slide translator's note says 40,000, but the speaker says 4,000 uh, civilian employees, mainly women, by the way. So now um, I will pass to my essential sources. These are statistical data figures, which maybe they are not entirely interesting, but it's worth mentioning that the army built 332 uh, buildings in Poland, but the buildings that they abandoned were very often uh, built dilapidated and damaged. But well, not, not always, but it did, it did happen sometimes that they left them in a very bad state. And so... Um, mm, uh, people who arrived from the east, they, uh, they, well, the people had to deal with this, this liberation army, this, this red army, and, um, and before the liberation of Lviv, uh, around 45,000 um, Polish citizens uh, left, had left Lviv, uh, you know, panicking and afraid of the red army, and we have uh, Rokosowski here. Uh, who is here uh, on the right-hand side, uh, accompanied by Marshal Zhukov and um, Montgomery, but he is here with his back turned to us. And now, uh, evidence of this, um, uh, of these, um, uh, well, commanded quarters and garrisons. So this is um, you know, Professor Knot, who, um, in his first year, he searched all sorts of uh, safe boxes in North Silesia, and he got uh, a, um, a bicycle uh, allocated and a rifle to help him in these uh, searches. So there's a situation of chaos here. Uh, and um, if um, Soviet soldiers, this announcement says, if Soviet soldiers come looking for accommodation, then um, one must report it to the uh, general command of the Red Army in Piasto Street. So, um, um, actually, uh, these spoils of war, you know, the, the average soldier would send um, um, you know, parcels home up to 10 kilograms. The higher the rank of the soldier, the more property they were allowed to, um, you know, these trophies of war, they, they, they called it a trofiena um, property, and so they were allowed to, to, to send home more. Not always did they stick to the um, discipline, but the Red Army sought to introduce certain order into that. And um, here we have some original prints, and uh, this is this is actually the topic of my, my presentation, and this is from the Lusatian collection, and they present a propaganda picture of the um, of the Red Army as an army that was liberating Poland, and um, and here, um, uh, that was presented to the resettled, uh, re to the Polish population being resettled in this particular manner. And uh, here we have uh, actually six points of view on this, and those emphasize that this is a friendly army, that uh, these are donors, really. Even uh, Kazimierz Lagos, uh, a priest from Wrocław uh, in announcements in some posters uh, addressed to Catholics. Uh, this um, canon from Wrocław, uh, he uh, actually talked about the um, how happy we should be that the Soviet army came here to Rosalizia. So they were presented as liberators, as the victors, as the, those who had defeated um, and the Nazis and those who had them um, Obviously, that was part of the narrative where the shed blood, you know, uh, to, uh, to, to actually fight for l people's lives and freedom. And uh, they emphasize that 600,000 graves of Soviet army soldiers were located on Polish soil, including 300,000 in Lower Silesia alone. So Russians were presented as those who sacrificed, who had sacrificed themselves for the sake of, of Poles and who uh, handed over, really, who handed over the Western lands to uh, Poles. And so these posters referred to 1918 also, to the year 1918, when the Russians had, as most um, 
uh, stated that had contributed to the regaining of independence by Poland. And um, uh, those soldiers were also guarantors of, um, of preservation of the western border. And here we have some original pictures coming from one of the websites kept by the descend descendants of, of the soldiers stationed in Legnica. And they have um, joyous recollections of, of that state. Three seasons, they, they say, in, in Poland, not more. And um, a lot of them, a lot of them uh, played in, on, on stage, performed on stage in the officer's um, house. And, um, and that was one of the New Year's Eve um, parties. But um, some of those um, meetings, especially between 45 and 48, were quite surprising. And they also, they also tell us something about the contribution that um, Soviet citizens made to help people who had arrived here in Lower Silesia, especially in terms of former Nazi concentration camp inmates or orphans, orphans um, left behind by German, by, 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 sorry, by soldiers who had perished during the Second World War. And um, all sorts of um, events were held, and uh, the, their authors were mainly figures of local culture and entities of local culture. It's just theaters, but also some some social associations um, organize, organized as grassroots initiatives, um, especially the Social Civic uh, League of Published Women. And I'm heading towards the end of my presentation. Here we have a militia, sports club, and field post. Uh, um, and uh, we had matches, exactly. And this is an, a poster. Uh, uh, on the second anniversary of the Battle of Lenino and so on. I'm about to end. So all these occasional prints, uh, here we have um, another poster for the Municipal Theatre in Wrocław. But I just wanted to show you, uh, it's exactly the, it's the dramatic theatre um, of the of officer's house uh, established probably by Rokosowski, and this um, theater kept operating until uh, around 1960. And so between 45 and 48, a performance from this theater made it a choir, but, um, but also the ballet. Um, and the singers, uh, they also took part in uh, all sorts of um, fundraisers and charitable campaigns. So. On the one hand, there's this propaganda which is um, ever present, but on the other hand, we have um, some interesting events. And um, although the um, Soviet army were uh, shown as those who def would defeat those who would exploit the common man, but um, you know uh, that was just one aspect of it. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was just a full taste of an interesting narrative on the Polish-Soviet relationships as observed in Lower Silesia. The highest intensity of which are uh, was observed in the years 1945-46. They were obviously very intense, which doesn't necessarily mean that the remembrance thereof was the positive one, not to mention the remembrance of the expelled Germans. As mentioned uh, uh, in the book uh, by Jana Hrefkryciuk, One should also highlight a few linking aspects, those that actually link the presentations delivered to this point, because when speaking about looting by Polish citizens, one should definitely highlight the fact that they actually were settling lands that have already been looted quite significantly, because the first looting was performed by the Red Army on an individual basis, but also on an institutionalized basis. 
as the previous speaker has mentioned. And she was, well, the Red Army was obviously uh, hasting significantly because in August 1945, following the decisions of the Berlin Conference, as it was referred to at that time, these lands were supposed to be taken over by the Polish administration, including the property that remained. So for the institutional looting, uh, as regards to that, we are not just talking about some mills, lates, or equipment of bigger or smaller manufacturing plants. The looting also pertained to well, furniture and furnishings of, uh, of flats, starting from carpets up to up to standing clocks that were actually reported in um, in certain bills of lading for the transport um, being dispatched to the Soviet uh, to the Soviet Union. Let's stick to the theme of resettling and this huge transformation or transition in the population of Lower Silesia following the end of World War II. One should definitely mention this uh, rather not numerous but very important from the political point of view, namely a group of, re of migrants, Polish uh, migrants from or re-migrants from West Europe who returned to Poland encouraged by the propaganda of finding decent living conditions. Migrants that quite frequently made their decision on returning to Poland in 1946 and 47 were motivated not only by social, not only by social, but also by political reasons. We are not only talking about um, Lower Silesia, but uh, Obviously, uh, actually, we're talking about the Dombrowa Gornica Basin. Uh, one of those migrants, Edward Gierek, was actually successful in the political venues. In colloquial tongue, they were called migrants here in uh, the, the basin of Obrzech and Nova Ruda. Uh, the fates, their stories are equally Interesting, and so I hereby give this floor to to yet another speaker. Bartosz Grigorcevich, I give you the floor. Thank you for this introduction. I would like to welcome you. So I've prepared this presentation. It's going to like automatically switch. Uh, I would like to talk about mining and miners in Lower Silesia or more specifically about the district of Kwotsko, since this is a, uh, in terms of historical research, this is a neglected region. And as I talked to different researchers who studied the literature on the subject, literature on the subject of the Novaruda mining field combined with the, uh, with other mining fields, which is obviously unacceptable. So, ladies and gentlemen, in France, because we are talking about precisely that, the remigrants, remigrant miners from France, actually, the uh, migrants there too, uh, actually, there were quite numerous population of Polish migrants. According to statistical data in France, there was about 420,000 Polish citizens at that time, partially. We're talking about military or wartime migration. Some of these people that went to France as uh, forced workers or uh, demarked soldiers. Generally speaking, estimating the industry of mining, it is estimated that uh, up to even 600,000 Poles were employed in this extraction industry. We're not just talking about coal mining. We are also talking about mining of ores. In 1946, the Polish party started the first talks with the government of uh, France on how to begin this re-migration, on how to encourage Poles 
employed in mining in France to come back to Poland. It was. It should be stressed that we are talking about some significant workforce employed mainly at the regions of uh, Padekale and the North Department. The French didn't agree to actually narrow down their workforce initially. Consequently, obviously, that would have an impact on the economic situation, especially in the mining sector. However, ultimately, the migration actually took place. Well, preemptively, with regard to the Polish party's activities, the French, roughly uh, at the turn of June, July 1945, reformed uh, the social allowances to the miners or the social allowance policy for the miners, in having introduced some specifications with regard to applying for French citizenship. And according to the available data, roughly 50,000 of these miners, 50, 3,000 working in the mining, so we are talking about 90-95% of them decided to file for French citizenship. However, many of them decided that they should return to their homeland, and we are mainly talking about miners' families. Uh, uh, active in the National Council of Poles in French, so an um, institution that was sympathizing to the Polish government, a kind of a fraction that was obviously conducive to the Polish uh, the government of that time. We should also stress that in June 20, 1945, the sections of the Polish Socialist Party were established initially. At the beginning of uh, January 1946, also the sections of the fractions of the Polish the Polish Workers' Party. With regard to the opposition of the French party, in, um, in February 1946, the first official agreement was made with regard to this remigration, assuming that in 1946, 5,000 miners would be transported along with the families to Poland. Why 5,000? Obviously, in the years to come, further new transports or, uh, or quantitative volumes of these people to be transported uh, were set, but unfortunately, it wasn't always possible to accomplish. In these tables, you can see some statistics. So on the 15th of May, 1946, from Lens, the very first transport train departed. On the spot, the Polish miners had to file special declarations. They had to fill in all the data that uh, were then necessary to speed up the formalities for the sake of passport clearance and so on and so forth, um, especially upon arrival to Poland. However, later on, it was also used, all the data were also used by the special group of the Ministry of Public Security established for this purpose that, well, boldly worked and active in the Kwatsko district. Well, all these transports actually went were some officers of the Kwatsko Public Security Office or Lipschitza Public Security uh, Office. On the spot, they, as the files show, they were recruiting the allies or informants or collaborators. But before the miners came to Poland, one would have to prepare the premises or uh, some some land for them. As far as the district of Novoruda is concerned, there were meetings with the managers of individual mines. They were held in March 1946. Something's wrong with my presentation now. So in March 1946, as I've said, there was a meeting with the managers of the mines of Novaruda in order to introduce them to the very concept of whole campaign and why Novaruda district was chosen. For the very reason that uh, it was a region uh, abundant in apartments or in uh, simply accommodation resources, because obviously accommodation was needed to allocate people. Obviously, the uh, 
the displacement of the German communities from these regions started at the beginning. So the changeover of population was instantaneous. In April, we had this huge uh, wave of, uh, uh, of, uh, of expulsion, after which came Polish new settlers to those regions. So in this first installment of transport, uh, up to mid-1946, we had this first batch of miners. In the second half of the year, roughly 800 miners with their families were also allocated there. So considering every family uh, was three or four persons, we are talking about a significant group of people. What should also be stressed, and I uh, might say it was clear from the photographs, these miners, which came from France, were experienced in working in mines such as those in Lower Silesia. Yeah. We are talking about high methane content um, mines with high frequency of accidents, but also uh, 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 with the shallow, shallow deposits of coal or ores. So they had to mine them, obviously, in a bent position on a very uh, thin deposit. Um, obviously, the initial installments of the transports were welcome with all due respect, with orchestras, with speeches, with moving moments, but it was not that peachy, always. Uh, sometimes the transport were left on their own. Sometimes the representatives of the public security uh, offices did not understand that there were actually people speaking French. Well, sometimes a little bit Polish, but with a very difficult accent. They were denied. They were denied acceptance. All the transports were actually uh, kept. It was even even uh, up to the point that uh, the transport uh, had to cover, had three days to cover Slovakia. Um, or uh, uh, or the um, the terrains outside of the uh, borders of Poland, and then they were kept. They were maintained at the border for definitely uh, indefinite time, and only then were they actually allocated in individual places. Part of the re migrants went to Wałbrzych. That's where they settled. Some uh, came to Nowa Ruda, and some significant groups were also uh, dispatched to Upper Silesia on account of the fact the. The Soviets actually transported, displaced a significant group of miners from Upper Silesia to the east. We are talking about more than a dozen thousand people. So, obviously, uh, the confrontation with the reality was not so positive. It was not the case that in France everybody got a house and garden. They were breeding rabbits. Well, the situation in Oseligia was not that nice, not that bright. Unfortunately, no gardens there, some flats. Uh, the place of work was several kilometers away of the place of inhabitation, which consequently forced the managers uh, of mines to purchase some lorries in order to transport these people. At least where there was no rail transport, they were transported to workplaces. Plus, in France, um, social security or uh, social allowances, or all the schemes, the welfare schemes were well developed including kindergartens, obviously. While in Poland, in Lower Silesia, they, these institutions were not, had not been established by the time our re-migrants simply came. Nobody expected such a situation and such a need. Plus, this very brutal crash against the reality. The re-migrants from France had to come to terms with the fact that once coming to uh, work, to workplaces, they were managed by foremen that were Germans, unfortunately so. At the very beginning, the foreman, uh, the labor of individual miners had to be organized around these foremen who were experienced miners, experienced foremen and managers of mines. They were the ones that introduced the Lower Silesian mines and miners into the very specificity of the operations. Um, in the initial period, 1946 and seven, what should be stressed is continuous shortage in supplies, not only food, we're not talking about the stores, the shops that we know of, that we can enter and just buy whatever. Now, obviously, food was rationed. 
And um, interestingly, uh, the minds of uh, Navarro were dependent on some state uh, government institutions. So we imagine that in mid 1947, every single month, about 150 tons of food was transported in Baruda, which was then rationed. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody got its share, got their share, because this influx of people was uncontrolled sometimes. So, according to the data, we can see some info that uh, soap and food was lacking, was in significant shortage. Not to mention what may be considered ridiculous at this point, but uh, uh, a commodity such as light bulbs. Light bulbs was also in the shortage. Everybody, every family uh, got as many light bulbs as uh, the number of rooms in their flats. Everything was rationed. Plus, a completely different specificity of work on the mines, huge problems with uh, oxygen and breathing masks, um, personal protective equipment such as escape uh, masks, some uh, work clothes. In 1946, there was a compensation agreement signed with Czechoslovakia, based on which what was bought from the Czechoslovak um, uh, plants in Nahod, in uh, in return of coal, was bought even cars, shoes, garments, because that was precisely what was in shortage in these regions. Consequently, to all these re-migration activities, the peak of which was in the years 1947-48. The Novoroda mine district mines received from 600 to 800 families, miners' families. It may not be a significantly impressive number. However, if you, you know, multiply by three or four, it constituted a significant community. Interestingly, by mid-1960s, this community was rather hermetic, was very closed, um, which is based on uh, reports from priests from individual parishes of the Ruda, Ruda district. We clearly stated that in 1965, people obviously did not go to any masses. They were not Catholics. They were not practicing Catholics, active Catholics. However, they were treated as a kind of alien uh, communities. Obviously, it was a significant problem to uh, the security services. Nobody understood that uh, someone was going here and, uh, you know, not speaking Polish, but dressed in some suit and, and, and wearing a tie. However, they worked in mine, which was, you know, from the security perspective, it was strange. Novaruda district, by the way, uh, is, was, and is still situated at the borderland. So at that time, there was regulation that every single person employed in industrial plant that was situated in a borderland had to be given certain specific pass, special pass, or a permit to work in this in this borderland, in this border zone. Therefore, a security service, a security office in 1946 started this enormous uh, campaign, Cryptonym West, where um, migrants or re-migrants were, were persecuted, were being processed because they were suspected of some uh, suspicious activity. On this note, the Novaruda district may not be as exemplary as Wałbrzych, where Gainers were always brought to Wałbrzych, but obviously out of Wałbrzych. The, the population structure of individual um, towns such as Świebodzice or Mieroszów changed because, as I've mentioned, this remigration campaign had its peak between 1947 48 uh, in spite of huge problems uh, in contacts with the French party up till 1949. In 19, uh, the, the campaign continued, and um, the last installment of this agreement was signed in 1947, but what came to Poland was, well, actually individual persons ever since. In the district of Noruda, just several dozen families were settled in the district of Novaruda, brought from France, and they were predominantly persons who had already had families in these regions before, so that was really an action com that were supposed to combine families. An interesting piece of information is also the fact that those 
who came to Lower Silesia, to the Kotsko Powiat, Kotsko district, hoped that they would improve in terms of uh, the conditions for the children in France, unfortunately. The prospects for the offspring of minors were not too interesting. Generally speaking, women could actually sort rock or distribute lambs or marks. However, having analyzed different documents, one could suspect that actually coming back to the country provided great opportunities for the minors' children, and especially for women and then youth. An interesting piece of info is also that of among the sons, male descendants to the remigrants coming from France in 1946 and 7, more than 50 people actually were enlisted into citizens' militia. But only a few of them actually survived by the end of the end of the service. Most worked for a year or two and unfortunately left the service. Many migrants also did not come to terms with the situation they uh, encountered and attempted to return to France. Um, based on some statistics and data, you could also see some files that were attempted to return to France illegally uh, in 1950s. Uh, unfortunately, they were apprehended and sentenced. With some other interesting facts concerning to the remigration campaign, thanks to them, sports clubs were established in Novaruda, which hadn't been the case before. Persons recruited to work and came from the east of Poland, never had any initiative of uh, organizing a sports club. But I'm talking about such small towns as Słupiec, Juków, Nowaruda. Every single one of them had a sports club with various, various sections. Well, obviously, football being the most popular uh, section. But also, a motorsports section was uh, also one of those established in Nowaruda. An interesting tidbit. Migrants, very experienced in political activity, uh, as I've already mentioned, became to a certain extent a kind of a backup resources for local organizations. Many of these migrants were enlisted in some uh, commissions, national commissions. Some of them were um, performing functions in district offices, so they continued what they started in France. As far as women are concerned, many of those women were employed in textile industry, which was rather developed in a district or in education or in, um, in the welfare sector. They were employed in a hospital that was actually established in Novaruda. There are obviously some disadvantages of the situation. That would be the end of my presentation as far as the remigration campaign is concerned. It was not as successful as, unfortunately, as the then um, state officials wanted because there were many miners with significant, with significant uh, significant uh, medical conditions according to which or on account of which they could not be re-employed in mining generally speaking the balance of the years 20 1946 uh, 48 where 14,000 miners were supposed to come in 1948 uh, however only a fraction of that number was remigrated however in the district of uh, Nova Ruda, a specific local community was created with the settlers from the east, the remigrants from France, from migrants from Belgium, workers recruited to work at the eastern borderland, and somehow they had to coexist together. 
I'm just disregarding the, another matter, namely the Germans that were left. They obviously had to coexist with the re-migrant families, and so my presentation is just another brick in the wall of the discourse on this matter. It's just the 17th uh, anniversary of that very campaign. So I would stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us this um, picture of the fate that um, that befell the re-emigrants, the, the, the re-emigrants who who came back from France to the their original um, original land, <laughs> and actually came back to what was referred to as the reclaimed territories or the recovered territories. So, on the one hand. We have these pro-communist interpretations, and that the French were generally accused of having an, an attitude that was positive towards the transformations that had been taking place. So they kind of stood out among this whole mass of um, people being resettled. On the other hand, there's this thing recalled in the reports of priests, for instance, this kind of indifferent attitude um, towards religion and this detached attitude towards the church, resulting perhaps from the ideological choices. But on yet another hand, there's this disappointment, which um, made many re-emigrants uh, Attem make attempts to return, actually, in a very traumatic manner in the early 1950s and later using um, using those opportunities provided by the by the Poland back then, which was liberalizing itself after after 56. So um, one of the more permanent elements were brought by the brought by these re-emigrants was the um, uh, actually petank, you know, the um, practice near Wałbrzych, um, and and um, I believe that we are short of time, so um, well, nevertheless we should exchange opinions after these three interesting interesting presentations. So I would like to nevertheless give the floor to you, so you can ask some questions. I was afraid that the vision of uh, coffee would actually obscure the uh, the um, the craving for discussion. Thank you for the very interesting presentations. Um, they really contributed a lot to my knowledge. But I've got not so much a question, but a reflection. This is for me, Mr. Surovit, about this part um, dictionaries. Well kind of food for thought. Um, well, this is very interesting for me that you um, made this inquiry and you looked uh, the, the word up in dictionaries. But um, I believe we have to bear in mind that, of course, these dictionaries, well, these are dictionaries of the Polish language, but they are not uniform. So Linda's dictionary is totally different. And I would be very cautious, actually, um, you know, if I were to kind of bring it down to a common denominator with uh, all the other dictionaries, because it is a historical dictionary after all. So um, Linde actually exam shows examples of usage of uh, specific words, uh, of first uses. And um, in this way, you can identify the German origin. But um, but in um, th that's actually the field of specialized language where it that penetrated straight from the German. That's the first thing. But it's a historical dictionary, so it kind of um, re reach up to the end of the 18th century. It's not a 19th century dictionary, even though it was actually published in the years 18 uh, or written in the years 1807, 1814. Second thing, Wachowski's dictionary. It gathered vocabulary until the end of 19th century. And then there's the Dictionary. And uh, maybe I, um, 
I kind of failed to notice that, but you gave an example, one of the definitions, but did you look at the actual article? Because the, this is um, this is a kind of bias dictionary, you see. So, so basically, that's one thing, okay? But um, I don't know if you looked in the actual entry, okay, uh, text. And, but I don't know if you can use it as a historian, but um, what the professor said, whether it had arrived from the general language or from the criminal um, argot, or um, um, the, um, basically, if you look at the history of the word uh, purportedly coming from um, items crafted by, by craftsmen, um, basically, it referred not to all craft items, but to those crafted items which had been stolen. So we have a kind of narrowing down in semantic terms of the meaning and an additional pejorative um, aspect given to it. So maybe we could give this um, beautiful linguistic introduction to this. Um, yes, to I believe it can be done, but cautiously, you know, with the um, um, careful with the dictionaries. <laughs> so, well, if vocabulary from the past is um, is quoted, you know, from the 16th century, then these historical dictionaries also show this to us, or the, or the dictionary of Old Polish, you know, we, we could reach there and, um, and do it, but careful with that when you, when you go about it. So, uh, however, I would like to ask this question, maybe I failed to hear it, uh, maybe it kind of, uh, uh, you know, I failed to notice it, about the re-emigrants from France, the miners, it's, it's a subject dear to me because I, I actually uh, work for quite some time in the North Pas de Calais um, area, and sorry if, if, if I failed to uh, notice that, but um, these were re-emigrants from the times of the Second World War, uh, forced laborers, but um, I wanted to ask whether, is it recorded anywhere? Were there any descendants of the early uh, those uh, emigrants from the um, early uh, part of that century, from the war gebiet, you know? Were there any documents uh, testifying to that? And so, you know, maybe these people went from the war gebiet to the um, Nord Pas de Calais. Um, so you're saying that these were people who often f didn't speak Polish, but they you know, spoke French, so that would actually show us that they were people who had actually been born much earlier or born in France, you know. So I'm curious uh, because the association of, of these people with Poland is still strong and they emphasize their Polish identity very strongly, but, but they're actually Frenchmen and, and, and it's, it's, when they speak Polish it's, 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 it's uh, interesting because they speak a dialect of sorts but it has features of early 20th century di dialect, but, you know, their uh, kind of intentions when they came to Poland, um, I encountered the situation of a family uh, in, well expelled from from France for their commu communist uh, sympathies of the father and the kids were really sad because well first they didn't speak Polish and secondly uh, the daughter of that gentleman the biggest disappointment was the fact that in France uh, you know she would get a box of or a crate of oranges every week and in Poland no oranges there so. Well, uh, there you go. Maybe there was an kind of amusing story to tell. Sorry, uh, do, do we have any other questions or comments? Reflections or other contributions? Yes, for Mr. Surovic, uh, as far as looting is concerned and the word shaber, please look into the Russian dictionaries because there's this Funka tool there. And then and, 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 uh, that's, um, that's uh, also burglars uh, kind of uh, ago. And um, well, maybe the origin of the word shaber, it might also come from that tool which uh, criminals would, y Russian criminals would use, not necessarily Soviet criminals, not yet. Uh, 
Thank you for these uh, valuable comments. Well, this is actually touched upon in the in the whole paper due to the limit time limitations. You know, I. I was unable to, to cover all the linguistic aspects, but these are valuable comments, especially Russian dictionaries, by all means, especially Martin Zaremba emphasized this, is that the word shaber for routine, actually, it uh, underwent a huge transformation around you know, mid um, 19th century, so I do agree with you wholeheartedly, but it was more about showing a certain dynamic which uh, which could be seen in the case of that word and what eventually we ended up with in 1945. So the roots of the word are in totally different, so I didn't want to carry on uh, or abuse this word linguistically because I'm not a linguist, simply speaking. and. Uh, you know, in terms of methodology, it's very uh, complicated. That's why I didn't use the word semantics in my whole presentation, because then I would have fallen into another trap. Yes, careful with that, you know, the, you know because uh, the frequency of a certain word, you know, um, in Linda's dictionary, it's not there, you know, so, so you mustn't generalize, okay? So methodologically speaking, on this note. <laughs> Okay, so I will uh, comment on the, the questions asked by by um, by you, madam. So the re-emigrants, they were descendants of the families you mentioned, but in light of documents available currently in the archival form, it's hard to um, verify this because we are currently in the process of receiving personal files of minors. And uh, I, um, however, worked on the Novaruda area. And so files of, of those minors are only about to be provided to us. So I had to rely on documents uh, which made it impossible to verify all this entirely. But a large part of this interwar immigration, as you rightly pointed out, were definitely descendants. Um, and the motivation, well, it varied. In the case of people who had some baggage you know, of experience or some some sort of um, um, track record, they, they wanted to come back to the problem to to you know spend their years of retirement or, or live until the um, in, in peace and quiet until their retirement. But many people were expelled from from France, uh, well displaced for their. Um, um, uh, for their political activity, especially for the strikes in 1940, when um, where the um, French authorities started started a um, an extensive campaign against the Communist Party party actions, and the um, Polish side also started a witch hunt, um, and the, 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 there was this obsession of spies, you know, and espionage. Um, also directed against the, the French. So, in any case, many families seem to expect bigger opportunities in relation to um, obtaining better education or better living conditions, and must, um, and you know, above all, uh, living among their own people and who spoke Polish, not French. Th those were the main factors, but. Obviously, we'd have to examine some individual cases. I don't have the full documentation, and I don't really like to speak about things I haven't seen in terms of documents. So, thank you. Coming back to the emigrants from France, yes, that was composed of two elements, actually. This emigration, this older emigration, so emigres who you know, from Westphalia or um, uh, North uh, Rhine Westphalian, so um, around you know 1918, 19, uh, 19 after the um, uh, defeat of, of Kaiser Reich, uh, and they f went there for economic reasons, but they were also encouraged by the, um, the French government. But another group was a group of emigres, Polish emigres, in the 1920s. Uh, actually, France was arguably the only country with which Poland had signed an official. The Republic of Poland had signed an official agreement on uh, the economic migration to France, and the wave was uh, was big enough to actually lead to a situation in which, despite the economic problems in the 20s and 30s, and the emigres being sent back in the 30s, uh, the, there were 400, 500,000 people. If we look at, if you consider Belgium and parts of the Netherlands. Um, if you if you if you add this, then then a large group stayed there, despite uh, some people having been sent back. And um, I don't want to 
actually uh, elaborate because we've um, exceeded our time limits to a certain extent, um, although I would be able to comment on some of the things. So uh, here's the um, long-awaited, much-awaited coffee break. I would like to ask you um, well, to, to, to have 15, 20 minutes tops, you know, uh, for the coffee break and see you afterwards.